啊。Ladies and gentlemen, dear friends from the architectural and arts communities, good evening. I'm the CEO of Taipei Performing Arts Center, Austin, Austin Wong. It is with great pleasure that despite the pandemic that we have two master architects coming to Taiwan after they have quarantined and joined our opening ceremony. Uh, the opening ceremony presents a great opportunity for uh, hosting a forum for the architects of this project to explain why this space is designed the way it is. Whether you have been here or not, uh, you need to know that it is a very revolutionary and breakthrough uh, theater which is very different from the shape, form, and program of a regular theater. I joined this project from basically day one. And I was I actually have a shovel for the groundbreaking ceremony. And mark on there is February 26. Uh, and uh, it, that was 10 years ago. And the reason I have followed through with this project over the decade is because I saw the design of this project. No matter how well it's built, how well it is equipped, the space itself is filled with dreams and it uh, has in immense possibilities to create so I call it the theater of the 21st century rather than the 20th or the 19th century. Why can it become a theater of the 21st? I'm sure the two master architects will explain to its full length when they, uh, ex when they present their ideas. We have 60 minutes of presentation by the two of them with 30 minutes for Q&A. Half of the Q&A will come from live audience and half from online audience. So after you've listened to their presentation, take full advantage of the Q&A and even you can question or uh, learn more about the ideas behind the architecture. This is the most important thing. I think the two architects require no introduction. You know them very well. They uh, have an amazing portfolio of projects. They are also curators uh, for the Venice Biennale. And they have books uh, that stack up very high if you put them all together. They have a profound influence on the architectural community. So without further ado, let's welcome Graham Kuhlhaus and David Genoten. Hi, uh, I'm extremely happy to be here. Uh, and uh, what we, we divided the work of presentation, I will present in a very precise way the ideas behind the project. And David will uh, kind of present, sorry. And David will uh, kind of present the more technical kind of issues and also what it meant to kind of realize that uh, in this place. Um, and I divided it in a number of chapters. The first one is free to ground. No one can imagine can from here how surprising uh, Taipei and Taiwan were when we first came here. Uh, we were really impressed by the kind of energy and by the kind of intensity of urban life. Uh, and of course, because it was a theater, we went to the theater. And there we were also uh, very enthusiastic because in Taipei, you may not realize it, theater is an issue of all generations. It's not a kind of simple middle class uh, issue or a single older generation. All generations are kind of together in the theater and that is probably because of the recent history of Taipei where the theater really has a kind of relevant role. So that was our first uh, discovery. Then we liked uh, in Taipei the way in which infrastructure is kind of very present uh, in every sense. And we particularly liked the fact that on this side and facing this side, there was a metro system in a kind of very beautiful and, and exciting design. 
And then, of course, what was completely surprising is the, the intensity of the night mar market. And what we really felt is how amazing it was that the Taipei government kind of decided to put a new theater in this place. This is a place of popular culture, uh, and, and typically the theater would be planned in a kind of more dignified, elitist place, but here in the heart of popular culture, that was going to be our new theater. And that was uh, a, a deep stimulus for us. The night market, I don't have to explain to you how amazing and intense it is and how late the Taiwanese uh, go to sleep. And the night market, and maybe the best definition of uh, popular culture is if street food is better than food in restaurants. Uh, and that was uh, kind of really the case here. The food on the street is delicious, and that was our first experience uh, kind of with the site. The intensity and the enormity of the night market and all the restaurants. Uh, before the competition was kind of run, the assumption was that the uh, entire restaurants would be completely gone and scraped. And most of the architectural projects, and this is, I will not name the, the architect, but this was a typical project that covered the entire site and kind of just sat there. And what we felt is that that would be a kind of very brutal way of raising street life. And from that moment on, we were kind of really concerned, if not almost obsessed, with lifting the building kind of off the ground and kind of reducing the impact of the kind of building uh, on the site to an absolute minimum. Uh, and, and that became the uh, driving force. That is why I call it free the ground, because only in that way could we uh, absorb the street life uh, almost uh, directly from whatever direction it would come and make the building an extension of the city. <clears throat> and here you see how we, you know, lifting the building off the ground, we really kind of opened up and, and maintained these very large areas around it. And this is actually the, the, the maybe one of the most radical uh, kind of propositions. This is the entire site. Almost the entire site is free and a very small part of it is occupied by the stage uh, machinery and by uh, some other kind of businesses. So actually, uh, we are uh, an, an urban presence, but a very discreet urban presence, and the building is supposed to kind of really absorb urban energy, the urban energy of Taipei. Uh, and, and so in that sense, and, and this configuration is actually a kind of very nice configuration because it, you, you look like an urban crowd. It would be nicer if you kind of actually stood. Uh, and, and, and this is how we uh, consider the building, uh, a living room. Uh, you don't have to pay uh, to be here. Uh, maybe you paid, but anyway, the typical public doesn't have to pay. And it's a living room kind of for the city, uh, absorbing movement from any direction, absorbing movement kind of from the metro system, and absorbing movement uh, in the situation of the opening, again, from all kinds of kind of rituals, all kinds of, I think the first guests here were gods uh, and uh, our first uh, very uh, honor for us. And then the kind of public goes uh, and enters the building in large uh, kind of quantities and then uh, congregates in this room, which is actually, and if you look at the floor, the, the first sign of luxury, uh, kind of natural stone, uh, is a kind of gesture of uh, kind of welcome. And then kind of from here, you go there to the large theater, here to the sphere, and then back to the kind of third theater. So this is really the driving force behind the kind of project was to, embrace, to, to engage urban life in its uh, most intense uh, form. The second one uh, I called uh, emancipate production. What is, I think, quite unique in the history of the theater is that we made the most visible part of the theater, this central cube, which we clad in glass. And in that cube, all the kind of public uh, events are taking place. Uh, the stage machinery is organized in, in it. 
and also all the kind of work and all the kind of rehearsal spaces are also kind of contained in this uh, uh, entity. And what we wanted to uh, create and, and do with that gesture is that rather than ignore the production side of the theater, uh, we wanted to emancipate them and, and give them, honor them in a certain way, but also give them kind of much nicer conditions than a typical theater where there's no daylight and where you know, the, the workers are actually working under difficult positions. Here, the workers, in the widest sense of the word, are kind of really uh, honored. And then kind of the theaters themselves uh, are cantilevered from that workplace. Uh, as you will have seen, uh, there are different codes for different spaces. Some of them are warmly lit, others are coldly lit, and that gives a kind of diversity, particularly at night, of these spaces. And higher up in the kind of uh, in the cube, we are also kind of facing work, uh, uh, working spaces, rehearsal studios, and and all the activities that need to uh, be done to prepare uh, a theatre performance. And here you see a kind of typical example. All these spaces have a kind of view over the city and uh, are actually oriented not on the kind of inside, introverted, but on the outside. So this is the second thing, uh, emancipate the worker. It's uh, uh, almost a socialist idea, uh, but uh, it's, it's an idea of uh, going against the grain of the kind of current gentrification and kind of separation between uh, layers of society. The third part, and this is a very crit critical part, is to do with all the ingredients that we have, three separate theaters, among other things, to do more with them than you could typically do. The theater is very ancient. Uh, this is a theater 2,000 years old in Palmyra. It has an auditorium, it has a stage, and through the stage there are kind of backstage. So we are dealing, when you're dealing with a theater, you're dealing with a tradition that is very, very old. This is the kind of typical uh, condition of the theater now, an auditorium. The auditorium is kind of wrapped in many layers. The stage, the stage is also kind of wrapped in many layers. And what it means is that you are, when you are outside, you're not aware in any way of what is going on in this building. Everything is oriented to the inside. There have been many theaters in, in recent times uh, built uh, among, and this is the theater in Beijing, uh, with three separate theater components. And I have always been very critical of them because there's an auditorium and there's a full stage condition there's a second auditorium in the full stage condition and a third auditorium. But between those auditoria and therefore between the technology that is necessary to create a stage, there's zero interaction and zero consolidation and therefore zero uh, value. What we did is kind of organize all the stage areas of the three theaters inside the cube uh, in such a way that there is an interface and an interaction between every one of them. And, and therefore, like a Japanese puzzle, these kind of theaters are uh, composed and organized in such a way that they create uh, an enormous new potential. Each theater is independent and can be used independently. But in this situation, you can also open up doors kind of between the theaters and create a kind of single uh, space, which is, for instance, from here to here, a theater with 100 meters, a uh, dimension of 100 meters. So uh, although the theaters are classical theaters, they also offer the space of a factory almost, uh, where theater makers can kind of improvise and where they can experiment. Experiment is a very important word in architecture where they can experiment with new configurations and with new ways of thinking of the theater. Here you see this kind of combination of two theaters. This was a competition uh, situation. We proposed, this was a drawing, a rendering we made in the competition. And it's unbelievably exciting. After two years of being in, uh, in, incapable of being in Taipei because of COVID, to actually see 
that this is now a kind of real, uh, reality. Here you see this kind of space between the two theaters, and even we see that they have uh, been kind of tested now, and that there is, you know, the beginning of an initiative how to use them, and that it's beginning to have a, a tangible effect on how theater can be performed in, uh, uh, in, in, in Taipei. And you see the enormous and unusual depth that can be uh, kind of generated, that is generated, and all the kind of possibilities that uh, exist. Also, this entire area can be used uh, for seating. So in that sense, uh, uh, and, and it's acoustically also performing, so that in every sense, the conditions of the theater are there. This is the scale, and I would say the scale of a factory kind of at the surface of theater making. <clears throat> so the fourth important point is, uh, and, and you kind of probably realize already that I'm trying not to be an elitist, um, that uh, it's very important, I think, that uh, public investment in cultural facilities is enormous. Uh, and uh, you could imagine that uh, a certain part of the population uh, gets jealous or offended if uh, people can, uh, select people can, can use uh, those facilities. So what we thought from the very beginning was very important, that the building is accessible for every kind of single person, every single class, and every single economy, and therefore, we thought of a path that goes kind of through the building. If you kind of enter it, you saw this kind of orange tunnel. That is a place where anyone can enter uh, for free and experience every kind of single component of the theater. Here you see the kind of way it weaves through uh, all the uh, layers of the kind of theater. And therefore, uh, and, and we don't know a single other theater that has this kind of facility independent of the theater process, there is this kind of escalator that then takes you in the belly of the building uh, and in confronts you with all the activities, with the uh, high uh, cultural activities, but also with the labor of uh, kind of certain people, the labor of the uh, workers, even the garbage uh, being taken out, but also enables you to have glimpses of the kind of uh, theater production itself, or the rehearsals of theater production, to end uh, at the roof level uh, in a kind of open corner, a kind of patio, uh, which is a kind of superb point to witness kind of the uh, city of uh, Taipei, to witness the hill, to witness the hotel, to see uh, Taipei's history, and then kind of ultimately from this kind of open corner, go into the top of the theater, uh, and have a kind of free view of the stage so that uh, without paying, the kind of performance can be kind of followed and inspected. And here you see that uh, image. So those are basically the kind of four key points that we wanted uh, and that we felt were crucial to inject and that are all directly related to the conditions that we found here, directly related to the context, directly kind of related to Taipei, and, and, to, and that we could never have done and would never have wanted to do in any other kind of city. This building is a unique outgrowth of what we found here. So then there is design. Uh, sooner or later in every kind of point uh, of architecture, you have to design. Uh, and basically, we were thinking about what to do and what language to employ in the three different uh, theaters. Whether we should emphasize difference or whether, on the contrary, it would be interesting to actually create unification between them. We were very inspired by this kind of boat, where, where every part of the boat is colored the same uh, color, and actually we adopted this with the approval of the artist and proposed that each of the theaters is kind of blue and that all the elements in each kind of theater are blue. And that is the main uh, coherence between the different uh, points. Um, so here, this is the uh, uh, GT. Uh, 
every material is uh, chosen in the same color, so the box becomes an, an investment in blue. The curtain is kind of interpreted almost as kind of one of the walls, and here you see the kind of realization of that idea. Uh, basically, the uh, auditorium is shaped to also deny the difference between uh, the parterre, the ground, and the balcony, uh, and there's a kind of continuity kind of between the two to make this experience so as intimate and as intense as kind of possible. This is a performance, uh, I think, four days ago. And here, David and I are looking at the kind of first test of the curtain and this test of these kind of similarities and, and seeing that the curtain actually is kind of very subtle. There are gaps between them so that the light behind is also kind of shining through the stage. So all of the, and David will talk about it, all this planning between the different parts uh, uh, requires an incredible coordination, of course, and is the kind of point of this uh, kind of building and also is why it takes time to understand this building and to appreciate this building because there is layer on layer of uh, ingenuity uh, spent on it. The box uh, there is uh, a classical black box uh, theater. It can be totally flat uh, or it can be uh, have a kind of sloping uh, auditorium, uh, completely flexible, kind of with the balcony. And basically, what we did in the whole thing is not kind of design lobbies, to design bars and to design additional elements, but simply uh, use and exploit every gap into the building. In this case, uh, a skin outside and a skin inside necessary for acoustics that then becomes also the equivalent of the kind of lobby. So in each, uh, every time you're kind of basically in an arg architectural uh, argument uh, and, and in an arch architectural logic that also offers you a lot of emotional uh, places. Here, the theater is a kind of flat plane uh, or there, the kind of black box uh, theater is a kind of intimate uh, surrounding. <clears throat> the round theater is uh, uh, slightly higher. That is why uh, you see the kind of escalator going there kind of at the beginning, uh, disappearing uh, into the unknown. Uh, and, and this is the bottom. So you're from the kind of escalator, you arrive in this uh, kind of lobby, and then you move in a space between the outside skin and the inside skin. This is a kind of series of staircases that takes you from the ground to the, uh, to the balconies. Uh, and then kind of suddenly you are inside the uh, theater itself, which uh, of course is round. It's an interpretation of the classical theater with uh, uh, a ground and balconies, but all in a kind of single shape. For me, one of the most exciting kind of parts uh, of this uh, particular theater is the curtain. Uh, the curtain is developed uh, with another company like the landscape inside, outside. Uh, and uh, the curtain is a membrane. It's not some kind of velvet thing that goes uh, up and down. It's a membrane. And it's a membrane that uh, enables all these kind of different uh, uh, configurations. Here you see the membrane kind of in, in reality. And what, uh, because it's not a curtain, but a stretched plane, it creates incredible expectations of what is happening behind it. And, and these uh, expectations are then kind of manipulated by the kind of possibilities of this membrane to uh, take uh, and, and adopt completely different uh, kind of openings from a classical door to kind of almost a letterbox and almost kind of non-existent. And again, uh, I think there is so much in ingenuity in, in, but so much theater itself in the kind of, in, in the facility itself. Uh, nature. Uh, I already mentioned about how this building is embracing the city and, and intensifying the city, but also, uh, we want to embrace nature because we are confronting uh, with nature and we are in the proximity of nature. And that is one of the exciting things about uh, Taipei in any case. 
that uh, just at the moment that you think uh, this is only urban, you find uh, a kind of oasis or uh, something completely different. So here you see the kind of building from the top of the kind of mountain, and here you see the top of the mountain from the building. Uh, and it's not only a kind of uh, 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 mutual uh, accessibility or visual accessibility, there's also kind of really a careful kind of planning so that on the roof of the big theater and on the roof of, uh, of the stage tower and on the roof of the uh, uh, black box, there are additional gardens that uh, are accessible kind of for the public here. This is on the restaurant and this will be kind of accessible to uh, anyone. Uh, and from this garden, you also have a kind of almost direct relationship uh, with the kind of beautiful uh, surrounding uh, that, that we have the luck to, uh, to, um, to share. And here again, uh, the roof, then the kind of smaller roof uh, or, or the ground, and finally the kind of situation on the ground. So, uh, it's not only that we are presenting a kind of technological uh, kind of marvel, or not only that we kind of really looked in a new way at the technology of the theater, uh, all to create an instrument for Taipei to uh, stretch and expand its uh, engagement uh, with theater or with performance. Maybe I should say performance, because that's maybe a more interesting word but we also looked at kind of well-being, at uh, uh, relaxation, and, and at the contrast. Uh, I'm almost ready. Uh, I'm almost done. Um, the last thing is I want to kind of talk about kind of function and icon. Uh, recently, in the last 20 years, uh, there's been an incredible uh, expectation that every architect would produce icons. And there's almost an uh, obligation to be uh, uh, pr uh, to produce icons. And uh, actually, uh, I have the experience that it's really extremely unpleasant to carry this obligation because it feels as if the world is expecting you to do something crazy, or to do something random, or to do something irrational. And so, what we did here. And I think that is actually a secret uh, source of uh, pride, is we took every kind of element, every function uh, at its most direct, the circular theater, the kind of stage tower, the two auditoriums, and basically juxtaposed them or combined them in kind of such a way that uh, by positioning the most functional diagram, uh, the overall impression was still not so much of an icon, but of a kind of eye-catching kind of building. And, and that's, uh, you know, maybe I'm a Puritan at heart, but it, it's very rewarding not to have to be crazy, but to be very precise and to achieve uh, an, a kind of effect that uh, can be uh, considered compelling. So this is my presentation uh, of the ideas uh, behind and of the ambitions behind. It's of course up to you to kind of realize, to, to uh, consider whether the, um, um, uh, the ambitions have been realized. But uh, uh, being here in, for the last uh, couple of days, uh, I am uh, deeply excited that you know, in collaboration with Taiwanese architects, Chris Yao, in collaboration with the uh, bureaucracy uh, of Taipei in an endless series of collaboration, we've achieved the initial ambitions and, and translated them in a kind of real building. Thank you. Now David will take over and... Hello. Also, good evening from my side. I'm very happy to be here after not being able to come here for two and a half years. Not only to see the end result, but also to finally see you again and to see our collaborators, uh, the Chris Yao Architects, uh, our own team here in Taiwan, the operation team with Austin, 
uh, the DCA as our client, EDPO as our client, new construction department. Uh, we have worked on this uh, very carefully together. And I will take you through that process uh, of careful consideration in each phase. First, I will start uh, with the planning services. This was immediately after it was announced uh, that we won the competition. We were asked to respond uh, to uh, the feedback we received, but also to uh, describe how we would actually start the project and run the project. And the first thing that we did uh, was uh, to create a team, a team that had an international part uh, and a part uh, in Taiwan. Uh, a part that always had a mirror image, so that always we had the dialogue between our perspectives uh, and the perspectives here. A team that also would directly communicate and face with the client uh, that we had, and that were constantly in debate and discussion about how we cr could create our ambitions. Uh, these ambitions in the beginning were mainly in word, uh, next to our competition proposal. We really looked at uh, the comments that were provided uh, based on our competition proposal. We also proposed adjustments based on them, uh, but we also had to prove our qualifications, which obviously you can do through a competition, but also in reality uh, to our client uh, so that we could come to a contract. We also looked at the site. Uh, one of the key things was that we had during the competition some information but also because there was still an existing building of the Schilling Night Market, we didn't have all information. So we could really look at what is the real condition. And this was one of the key things in this uh, services. Uh, we found that the original report of how uh, the geological uh, elements would be, actually, unfortunately, would be a little bit uh, less good. Um, we also looked at the code and, and developed together uh, with Christian Architects a an, an strategy of how to answer to the zoning uh, regulations, to the coverage ratios, and also to see how our building actually fits within your codes and your regulations on the site. Key to this was that we could potentially go higher on this site, but you see it surrounded by all kinds of apartment buildings where people live. And we really wanted to communicate with them uh, in the same height and in the same uh, plane and, and level, almost as to being the opposite of the street, uh, being part of the street life. And therefore, really, uh, we took it up to this 54-meter uh, uh, height of the cube. Um, building in an uh, earthquake zone, uh, very special, of course. Uh, coming from the Netherlands, we don't have earthquakes. We have water. Um, but for us, uh, it was interesting to kind of develop uh, a massing as we have here in an earthquake zone because, of course, when there is an earthquake, the building uh, needed to be able uh, to survive. We also looked at the green on the site. We adopted it in our green plan. We moved some of the trees temporarily out that are now back into our parkland, uh, which for us was very important. And we mainly discussed endlessly and endlessly with the client and with uh, the operation uh, people that were asked to review us about quality and not only architectural quality, but also spatial quality, materiality, and all kinds of uh, lo levels of quality. We talked about organization. Building a building like this is a, a once in a city experience. And, and of course needs a complex organization that communicates very well and operates very well. We also talked about time. I get back to that a bit later because we all know that it took a bit longer than anticipated in the beginning. Uh, we of course had to uh, look at the budget and, and money and how to spend that money. And information, how would we communicate about uh, what we were doing and, and the endeavor that we were taking on together. An important part was that we communicated constantly through our international voice, but also through the local voice and with the bureaucrats uh, and, and the reviewing parties together. We really were in this together. One of the key things also was to try to test, uh, because some of our parts in the competition proposal uh, needed further discovery, uh, which we also actually hope that the building delivers. We envisioned opportunities, but we think there are many more, and we hope that the people of Taipei, uh, and especially the creative creators, take this building to discover endless possibilities that we could not imagine 
as the designers uh, of this building. After we went through that process, which was uh, mainly an administrative process, uh, we started working on how could we make our proposal even better. And especially under the, under the ideas of what we reached back from the jury or from the review members uh, in it. For example, uh, one of the things was the public loop. Rem already talked about it. And in our competition proposal, that public loop was there but it went to three platforms. It only peeked into the theaters, but for example, it didn't go through any of them. And the reviewers uh, of the operation uh, actually said to us, wouldn't it be very excited if people that go through that public loop can actually look into one of the theaters and experience what theater making actually is. So we came up with this loop that Ram described uh, through uh, the Globe Playhouse, uh, through the Sphere uh, Theater, to see uh, through uh, a technical part of the grid uh, onto the stage and to really uh, be able, behind glass of course, so you can disturb the performance, uh, uh, enjoy it uh, as a lower threshold to theater. And here you see how that is actually realized. People can sit down there, uh, look through the window and see uh, what is happening downstairs. I will not go through all the elements, just a few, uh, but for example, also by freeing the ground, as Rem just described, we had an enormous plane that we could work with. And one of the exciting things is also when you walk around there now, you see a lot of kids running around, you see a lot of people actually even on skateboards enjoying uh, that part. And we really hoped that we could program it. And I believe that there might be some people downstairs also looking at this lecture uh, on the stage of the puppet theater uh, that we actually injected uh, from the car park basement because we didn't explain yet, but there are two layers of car park and moped parking underneath uh, where we injected this puppet theater. Uh, that in a normal circumstance is flat, uh, but that actually can pop out and an outdoor performance can happen uh, and the people that are simply on uh, the plaza can enjoy. You can of course also use this platform in many endless uh, configurations. An important part in our uh, orientation of the building was the infrastructure and the hill. Uh, the connection between the theater the infrastructure intensity and the hill uh, tranquility was important to us. And we really wanted to go from that plaza directly into the MRT. And that was an idea from us, but was actually embraced uh, by uh, the people uh, that were reviewing us. And they were actually saying, we should make this something special, not just an underpath uh, with tiles, but something that can be animated and that is a lead up uh, to theater making. And uh, we worked together uh, with uh, uh, the MRT people and also uh, the public uh, uh, works uh, department to create an exciting connection that already uh, shows the performance and art uh, in its bones. For example, on the stairs, but also kind of it shows a possibility to exhibit uh, on the walls in light. Here there is an exhibition, for example, with the people that worked on the building as their working sense, but also their home and family life uh, compared together. After uh, we went through that first uh, review period, uh, we came to the concept design and we made the, the detailed uh, design uh, further and elaborated on it. After that, uh, we went through a long review process uh, with a lot of comments uh, coming back from different types of reviewers based on architecture, based on operation, based on urban uh, configurations, based on code issues, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And for example, one of the reviewers is now the director uh, that is, uh, has introduced the project. He uh, wanted to know how you actually, in such a compact volume uh, with three stages together, bring all the large stage props up to the theater level. And the largest stage prop that the brief uh, described was 10 meters in length, about uh, half a meter in uh, width, and about three meters high. So we simply uh, started working from the loading dock to the different uh, uh, um, elevators that were uh, present at the loading dock, how these props would fit in, how you would turn them, and you, how you would bring them simply to the stage. So that, hill, that whole trajectory uh, was projected by us to convince uh, the operation team 
uh, that these things could actually uh, work in a very compact volume and that you actually go with three elevators to the three different theaters uh, at the same time. Um, from a perspective of urban situation, you obviously want a building that can also be maintained. For example, the facade cleaning was an important uh, topic. Uh, we introduced new materials like the glass curtain, you could say. Uh, we introduced kind of the aluminum on the theater to make it opaque. And we also introduced the West Tower aluminum facade with the different types of openings. We all came up with a strategy of how to clean them and how to actually do that in what region, region and kind of explain that uh, in many ways. So we're using cleaning from the ground and maintenance from the ground, but also the whole top of the project uh, where the park is, is set up in such a way that you can reach the different elements to actually uh, be close and, and maintaining it. Um, as you probably have not seen yet, but if you have been in the theaters, you see that actually in the Grand Theater and in the uh, Globe Theater, there's full orchestra pits uh, to be able to perform music uh, at the same time as there is a kind of a performance by the uh, theater makers. Um, how do the instruments actually move uh, towards uh, that uh, uh, orchestra pit when it comes down? is an important thing, and especially these uh, very uh, large pianos, and they are really large. And again, we plotted uh, how they would be stored, how they would come, and how they would enter from below into these orchestra pits. So uh, by proving, uh, we could uh, show them that actually uh, a full orchestra could uh, engage uh, with this uh, Grand Theater orchestra pit, for example. A very important part of the project were the sidelines and were the dimensions of the theater. Um, Tape asked us to create a theater where people could be close to the stage, where they could uh, really enjoy the intensity of the performance and at the same time could be with a big uh, group. For example, in the Grand Theater, in the brief, it was described that the last row of the people should only be 31 meters from the front of the stage. Uh, and that everybody in the room should have excellent view. So not like in many theaters, the people that are sitting in the front have great view, in the middle probably also good, but at the back a little bit less. Here they really wanted this democracy over the whole uh, plane, which means we had to really almost mathematically calculate how we could make the rows uh, and how we could actually lift them up so that people could look over each other. And here you see a fragment of that, uh, where you see the razors, where you see the depth uh, of the rows, and also how people would sit and actually have a full, unobstructed view uh, to uh, the stage. This, this meant that we don't have a situation like this, where we have an, a zone where the best views are, a zone where the middle views are, and a zone where uh, less good views are, but actually everybody has a good view. Uh, which uh, in, in some ways also became uh, some sort of handicap in the recent uh, criticism. Then um, we did the same for the other two theaters. This is the Globe uh, Theater. Uh, we have only a distance of 25 meters from the last seat to the front, uh, and which is that uh, oval proscenium. That is extremely close. So people are almost on the stage. And then with the round uh, proscenium, they have a very intense relationship with what's happening on stage. The other way around also works, so the people that are performing feel surrounded by the people and feel the energy of what they get. Um, we also spoke already to people that have performed there, and they say it's an experience that we have never had in other theaters before. We are so close and that intensity is there. Also there, we worked very carefully on these sidelines, and we worked very carefully on how people could actually move into their seats and move out to their seats. Um, one of the things is obviously when you lift a building up from the ground, uh, that you need to bring the people up also, and that you need to bring them to their place. Uh, we did a full uh, simulation of how that actually would work. And as you can see in each theater, there's three modes of going to the seating. The escalator, the elevator, and the stairs. Not all places can be reached by all three, but most places can. 
So for example, if you go to the GT, and there was a little change since this, because here the escalator was still in the middle, you see that about 90% of the people take the escalator, uh, about 8% uh, of the people take the stair, and about 2% take the elevator that is next door. And that is where you kind of how you move uh, towards it. In the PP, it's slightly different. Most people go by this long escalator to the bottom part that Rem described, but there's next to it elevators uh, that bring people up also into the levels uh, where their seats are directly, uh, and they come from the site into the theater. For the blue box theater, uh, we have again all three trades together, and there will be a bigger mix between uh, the uh, stairs and the escalators because uh, there are different levels where you then arrive. Uh, for example, if you want to have a coffee before uh, you take the stairs, if you want to go directly to your seat, you take your escalator. Fully animated also, the escape times were calculated and uh, animated to convince the fire department that we could bring people in and out and up. Um, with that also it means you need, because we have so many layers in the building, you need to distribute things. One of the things that we have distributed, for example, is the toilets. Uh, we have done a very careful count of male, female, general, neutral, and also kind of ADA uh, toilets over the whole uh, part and over each level. This is ground floor, uh, so below us. Uh, this is the first level of the theater, uh, also connected to the uh, blue bo box uh, with the ADA seating, uh, an elevator that brings you up, and also uh, the toilets uh, that are connected uh, to them. Um, a very precise planning, uh, constant communication again uh, with the people of the operation team. And here we see that we of course need to tune a little bit of how this actually works. Uh, and, and one of the things, for example, is have distribution of ADA um, uh, over uh, the seating level and over the floors, maybe a bit more than we envisioned. Uh, on, the, uh, uh, on the Globe Theatre, uh, we have a situation where people have close to the elevators uh, the uh, toilets, and then they can move directly at the same level uh, to their seats. Uh, the upper levels uh, need to move down a little bit to go into a larger uh, toilet setting uh, uh, next to it. So we passed uh, these detailed reviews on all levels, got our building permit, and then we started uh, 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 tendering out uh, to find a contractor. You can imagine for a project like that, that is not an easy thing uh, to do, because nobody has built this ever before. So you cannot ask, have, do you have experience with this? Uh, you need to ask, how willing are you? How technically underlaid are you? How much are you willing to come, become part of our team and discover together how we are going to build this in this uh, condition? Uh, to do that, we really uh, discussed uh, to the government to really start with the uh, performative written uh, specifications. Normally, that is kind of not uh, the way to go here in, the, in Taiwan, but here we really wanted to make sure that we could describe exactly what performance needed to be delivered uh, instead of uh, uh, trying to prescribe this is what you have to do because we welcomed the input of the specialist to be able to build it. We wanted to comply uh, with international standards and tests, not only the Taiwanese ones but also overall because we hope that also international uh, uh, people will come and play and use this theater for you and, and that of course uh, needs uh, communication. And we always indicated what our preference was, but we also asked if you have a better idea or you think something can perform in an equal way, please come to us and let's have a discussion about it so that we can find the best way that works best here in Taiwan. We illustrated this with one of our projects that is in the United States, the Seattle Central Library, which is also really a living room to the city. Of course, not a theater, but a, a, a library. But people really gather there and meet each other uh, in a total different uh, climate. And we, we showed them how we would actually tender out a project like that uh, and how it worked, even the specifications. So we were able to do so, uh, and that meant that we really could describe all our proposed materials in great detail. And from the beginning, we had 85% of all the materials that you see used here sourced in Taiwan. 
because when we come and build in a culture, we really believe it's important to work with the specificity of that culture and to really work with the traits that are available here, the craftsmanship that is available here and the specification of material that is available here. We introduced a few uh, unique materials, for example, the glass curtain, which could not be uh, fabricated here, but was, uh, we had experience with it uh, overseas. And we introduced uh, these engineers here in Taiwan. They also stayed with us, worked with us to create a system that works for here. Um, all these elements were specified, and you already saw that REM uh, specified uh, the blue parts, uh, three different colors. Uh, the GT being, or the Grand Theater being the lightest, uh, the Globe Theater being the middle uh, blue, and uh, the MT being the, the darkest uh, of, the, uh, of the three. But all in the same philosophy of everything has that color. We went to the Grand Theater here to show uh, that blue is actually a good background color for theaters. We made the walls there that are red, a blue through long uh, fabric sheets and turned off the light. And you see that actually the blue goes more to the background uh, than the traditional theater red uh, in, in the walls. Uh, so we had to also through testing and showing proof that the ideas that we had uh, could actually really work and would be an enhancement of the situation. Uh, we did that for several things. I already said the uh, S-glass, which is a unique uh, material, uh, which is produced uh, in Spain, uh, but together with a local engineer. And you see how uh, that works uh, without a substructure. It's able to carry itself. There's a very direct relationship between inside and outside. At the moment, that relationship is such that people look at us and probably see us very well. A bit distorted, but uh, so when I do this, I probably look very funny. Um, but they look in. Uh, during the day, uh, we all look out and we see that green, we see that intensity and that infrastructure. Um, also, the sheet of uh, marble that you are sitting on is the first introduction in this industrial coming from the ground uh, towards the theater moment where luxury of natural stone is introduced, uh, almost as a carpet, uh, uh, so that we would take the traditional elements of a theater like a carpet a step further into a kind of a new uh, dimension. We looked at this, uh, worked it out, and at, in the end found um, the, the right material together with the contractor here. And you see this space is used intensely today for an activity, but normally for people gathering. It's really the gathering chamber before people uh, distribute to their performance. And lastly, I already said uh, the idea of the site uh, was more positive in the competition and then afterwards it became very uh, hard to find the right way to solve uh, uh, the earthquake situation. And we introduced for this project a base isolator. I can explain it maybe the easiest with my hands. Uh, it's like a sorcerer with a bowl in it uh, and the building is built on top of that bowl. When there's an earthquake, it starts rolling in that sorcerer and it actually, at the end of the earthquake, simply comes back to the lowest point uh, so that the building would not tip over or that cracks would appear. Uh, and, and we could actually really calculate how much pressure on each of these elements are. So we are sitting on these base isolators as the base of our uh, endeavor. And you see there's a plate on top which has the steel structure. Uh, and if there is an earthquake, uh, it moves, uh, but it com always comes back to its position, which is a very exciting new idea of how to uh, create a technical building like this. We also looked at the theater, uh, and especially theater making and theater experience. One of the key things is obviously how the uh, theaters are and how the machinery and, and also the seats are experienced. We really wanted to create a seat that uh, had uh, a one uh, singular movement so that when you uh, uh, see uh, entering the, uh, the theater, you don't see single seats that are half open or half closed, but that actually is in one bar as, as long as it could be. And that also creates as much liberty in the uh, row uh, to move to your seat. And we compared that seat with uh, many uh, different theater seats around the world. I put only four up here today, two in Taiwan uh, and also two internationally. Uh, to show you that actually the dimensions and the way this was designed is completely the same 
as in many other theaters around the world and in your own uh, country. Then we also mocked up these seats uh, to kind of really make sure it would work. And uh, we went through an extensive review process in which Rem and myself sat in these seats, but we are unfortunately not the norm here. We are very tall. Uh, we were very comfortable, but also kind of people of smaller size could sit in them and really understand. The review party of the government, uh, the review party of the theaters, all kind of went through this review process with us and selected this seat. The unfortunate thing for the GT seat was that they were delivered uh, to the site just before the most unfortunate event we had in this project, namely that the contractor that we were working so intensely with uh, went bankrupt. Uh, there were too many risky, risky projects they were working on, and in the end they couldn't uh, stand. Um, and uh, that meant that these seats were already delivered, and they were stored at the ground floor, unconditioned, in boxes, uh, without any air conditioning, which not visually damaged them, because when we took them out of the box, they looked very uh, good. But when we put them in the theater and started using them, actually we saw that they were, uh, um, their maintenance uh, was difficult because it, they started damaging very quickly. And that was because the sustainable recycled material that we used um, needed to be conditioned also during the st uh, storing of the project, and it actually didn't. Uh, so this damage started appearing. Immediately we worked again with the client of the operation team, but also with our client DCA, to come up with solutions, uh, new uh, fabric, new upholstering, and kind of in a few months from now, these seats will be completely new, reupholstered in blue uh, material that will not have that same uh, problem. Yesterday, I, uh, and you see that here, I even did a uh, kind of performance test for that. The Globe Theatre, an important part, the seats that we designed are connected to the round shape of the Globe Theatre. They have their own individual armrests and they have a very special feature, namely a seat that moves forward to give more comfort when you lean into it. Uh, so when you first go and sit, you don't notice that, but when then you lean back a little bit, the seats become longer and you sit actually much more comfortable. Something people need to discover and people need to get used to. Um, but it was very well uh, mocked up again, again with all these dimensions uh, that we uh, showed you before. Then in the multiform theater, uh, we have a situation where flexible seating can go anywhere, and we developed a seat uh, that you can actually fold and put into a rack and position uh, in any other uh, place. Um, here you see that procedure, it's four steps, and then you can put it together, so you have a full flat floor, or you can put it in different configurations, so you have a central stage that works with the grid above. This is the fully folded out version, so that you go from the balcony all the way down. Um, theater making is also a lot of technology. I will not go into much detail because it's not too exciting to listen to and see. But one of the things that is important is acoustics. Uh, not only acoustics, dry acoustics without AV, but also wet acoustics as we know it with AV. So we tested these holes individually on both uh, occasions and in different configurations. So with Chichu Opera, with Western Opera, with Drama, with Dance, in all these kind of configurations. And also kind of in, in, in depth through modeling, but also through building uh, these spaces and looking how they perform. But key here was of course the super theater. If you provide a large space like that, how do you do it and how do you actually kind of make sure that it, that extra opportunity also performs to the maximum and can uh, really engage uh, with a performance that will be written specifically to it. And you see here that the acoustics are tuned in such a way that even the super theater can completely accommodate the same conditions as the individual theaters. Lastly, something I find really nice, not many of you will be able to see it unless when you go down and you see behind the information center and they're operating uh, the lifts. Uh, the understage of the GT is very special. They have four uh, elevator elements uh, in which we can store in the belly all kinds of props, uh, but also the seats, for example, from the orchestra pit, bring them down, store them temporarily and use it as an orchestra pit. A very uh, special feature uh, for this theater alone. And you can also kind of suddenly appear from out of the ground uh, with them as, uh, uh, as a theater maker. 
the facade, uh, an important part of the project, and luckily we were able to build the facade in a one-on-one -on -one scale uh, for a segment in the factory that was actually helping us. Um, not only the S-glass, not only the shelves that carry the S-glass, but also the aluminum skin of the three different theaters. We were helped there by shipbuilders that have a lot of experience in building aluminum facades, and they also helped with the builders of buildings uh, together to develop this. So we did many tests, also, for example, for the black aluminum on the western uh, part with different types of openings, the most open for the offices, a lot of daylight in, a bit less open for the dressing room so that actors don't fall, uh, look peeked into but feel still the connection with outside, and then the logistical areas that are closed. We did a lot of tests on how we would treat the aluminum, and we actually hang them outside on the site so that they could weather and we could see what their behavior was. And in the end, we choose uh, one way of dealing uh, with the aluminum uh, that we then endlessly exercised with the people that were going to build it so that all these elements would be uh, uniform. For the Globe Theatre, that was of course a bit more difficult, and especially because we had to put segments together to create this unique shape uh, that it has. And we did a lot of testing uh, of how we could control uh, the joint, uh, bringing things together and have this uniform view of the globe uh, uh, on the outside. And in the end, uh, we found a way to have uh, um, these seams in between that are eight uh, centimeters wide over the whole surface uh, of the Globe Theatre. And always we had the control sample there when we were actually building the ball uh, here uh, within the scaffolding. So we could always refer to what we discussed with the contractor, what we promised to the client, and that we would simply see that we could uh, deliver. Unfortunately, as I already said before, uh, the contractor went bankrupt. Uh, we uh, found ourselves in a situation that we didn't have a contractor uh, at that moment, and how could we get a new one? It was difficult to get one in Taiwan that had all the traits that we exercised so much with all of them. So we proposed a different retender strategy, uh, and Chris Yao and his team were very instrumental in that conversation. Uh, because we have a lot of experience internationally, but not in the Taiwanese market. And we propose to actually start tendering out by trade. So for the facade, for the interior, for uh, the theater, the technique, uh, for the chairs uh, separately, instead of the coordination of one. So we brought in specialists to finalize uh, the building. We showed again that these things were possible, and the new construction department that took over at that point uh, agreed with us that this was a good strategy. So we started tendering out trade by trade, starting with the facade. Um, during the bankruptcy, the S-Class received some criticism, and actually uh, we uh, came back to that criticism by showing them that this is not a new material that is actually widely used, not only by us, but also by other uh, architects around the world, and not only in Europe, but actually over the whole world. Um, and we showed them the performance of the mock-up that we luckily had, so we could prove to them that over time uh, this was a good uh, system. And then it was put in place, uh, and also the joint between the aluminum and the uh, glass curtain uh, was orchestrated well. And here you see some notes between the architects and the new contractors and the engineers of how to actually do that and how to make sure that we would create this technique. Next to that, we also kind of looked at the doors or the openings in it. We had hoped that we could do that with the same system, but then uh, we created a much more practical uh, proposal where we could actually create flat doors uh, that open to the terrace uh, of the restaurant. Um, and there were also small things that uh, the new contractors told us, hey, will this work or how can we actually do it smarter? For example, the fire doors in the, in the Globe Theatre that were run around before, he said, can we not have a round sheet that is fixed and actually doors uh, that are square uh, that open up because that is uh, less vulnerable. Now, we worked with them on developing that proposal and that's also what you see now in place. Um, one of the things of the terraces, we cannot see it today, uh, is that we had originally 
used uh, wood for that, but the weathering and also the change in climate uh, create a situation uh, that we looked at here, engineered wood, which means a wood layer on top and an engineered bottom uh, so that over time uh, that wood would stay uh, sufficient. There are a lot of uh, selection meetings, uh, which product and now it's in. And then finally we were rebuilding uh, the project again, uh, first starting with the facade and then with other trades. And luckily still internationally this project, although this uh, slow hiccup uh, was uh, viewed with a large anticipation and really uh, looking at how this could kind of really be a new type of theater. The last thing we done uh, while we were rebuilding uh, was looking at the public art. We believe it's a pity that we uh, design uh, a new type of uh, theater and then put a separate art piece inside. We actually would like the art piece to talk with the building and inspire uh, vice versa. So we worked with Inside Outside to create art pieces in the theaters, uh, the curtains, and also to develop special signage uh, that would direct intuitively the people through next to the technical signage you obviously need for evacuation and for clear indication. So for example, the GT curtain, we did many uh, different types of proposals. We looked at how fabric could be joined and Rem showed you there's a slit of transparency in between. Then we also had to fit in a new rail because the house curtain is still there uh, to find the position where we could actually inject this art piece in front of the house curtain and then how we could operate it with uh, tracks, both uh, in a situation where machines were driving it, but also manually when there would be a problem with it. And here you see in daylight conditions that curtain, um, and here you see it uh, when the light in the theater is out and actually the light comes from, up, uh, from, be, uh, from the back uh, from the stage. The membrane rem already described it, also a very special feature, especially the tension that is needed to move it is important. So we needed different tracks. We developed this together with Geritz, uh, a specialized uh, company that is uh, doing these tracks. And then uh, we created these uh, opportunities that Ram already described. And the special signage, very intuitive, namely a ball for the globe, a box for the blue box, and a wedge for the grand theater, and in the colors that you find inside of the theater. You, when you come here for the first time, obviously don't know that, uh, but you see the shapes from the outside. But when, when you have been here, you of course understand the colors, where they come from, and how you move through the building. We also made other signage for the toilets, for the general neutral ones, for the male and the female, uh, but also for information, for stairs, for taxi, for coffee, etc., etc. And here you see that layer uh, applied. We did this together with uh, Aaron Nhi and with uh, Bias. Uh, in the execution, two very good graphical companies from here uh, that helped us work this out. And then uh, also the special signage uh, that indicates you where to go in a very intuitive uh, way. This was the render that we made. Uh, this is a picture I took this afternoon. Uh, and you immediately see, okay, that's where the blue box is, right? Um, then when you move up, uh, you immediately see, and it is next to uh, that screen, I immediately see where the wedge indicates towards, which is the ground theater, and then the wall, uh, we can see it all there. Uh, go there and you find yourself in the PP over time. We done this not on our own or with the designers from here, but we actually worked with the people of the environment uh, around here. Uh, we invited other artists in to discuss with us and to create by the behind the scenes uh, int intel. And we even did design workshops with anybody that want to join. Uh, we also kind of looked at textiles that are very clearly here and even created documentary about this integration of public art into the architectural uh, design uh, as a unity. So here you see that the process that we went through had many different phases uh, with many different levels of detail, but always in a very strong engagement and in a detailed conversation uh, between us, uh, between our collaborators, uh, with our client, uh, with the people from Taiwan, uh, and also with the people surrounding the site to create this uh, project. And we really hope uh, that the next step is to uh, really embrace uh, the project, learn about its possibility, fine-tune it together, and bring it uh, to life. Uh, we
we, we thought it was extremely important to also kind of reveal this part of the process uh, because we needed to maintain the kind of tension and the kind of involvement over 10 years and that this kind of uh, activity is also a very creative uh, activity uh, and therefore deserves to be kind of projected. So now the building is open um, and what we can really regret, uh, of course deeply, that we were not here in the last two years to participate in the kind of testing, to participate in the training, to participate in kind of really creating the uh, atmosphere for the opening and that we were absent in terms of communication. So that is why we are extremely happy to be able to communicate uh, actually for the first time that we are here. We are also not going away. This is not the end for us. We will stay until this building is uh, gone through the kind of transition and, and the kind of opening process, the learning curve that is kind of implied uh, in that. And we will be here uh, as an office. This is uh, Chayu, but we ourselves will also be here. Uh, we were we are discovering the building uh, kind of ourselves uh, almost as if we didn't design it uh, and basically looking at uh, with astonishment that so many intentions have been kind of realized so many ambitions have been kind of realized thanks to this incredibly intense kind of form of collaboration and we are kind of really deeply welcoming also the kind of interaction that we can now uh, launch with the press uh, of uh, Tape, with the uh, political levels uh, of Tape, and where we can basically have a frank discussion about the building. And I think that more than anything, uh, any building of this kind of complexity needs patience, it needs experience. Uh, none of you have probably kind of seen many parts of it. Uh, what we are really pleading for, you know, try to get to know the building, uh, try to get to experience the building, to enjoy the building, and, and basically embrace the building. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right. So. So we will quickly proceed with QA. Uh, there are two parts to the QA. There are online questions uh, in English and Chinese. And we will also open the floor for uh, questions from the live audience. We will start with the live audience. Does anyone have a question? Would you like to be the first one? This is an amazing opportunity. After you've heard the presentation from the two of them, uh, after you've heard about the ideas, any gaps you would like to fill? This is a great chance. Uh, can I can I see uh, raising hands of who has an architectural background in this uh, auditorium? Yeah. Wow. <laughs> okay. Okay. So so we we are uh, talking to mostly architectural audience. Uh, and, and we consider you from now on as ambassadors who have the kind of responsibility to make the larger population of uh, Taipei uh, embrace this building. So I actually have two questions. First one is, um, what is the um, 
the initial idea of how you came up with these specific shapes, uh, whether it's the sphere, the, the cube, and that really awesome uh, large theater, how did you come up with the shape? The second question is, what uh, inspiring words do you have for aspiring architects who are sometimes trapped in this field and who has a lot of like, great ideas? And what aspiring words do you have for them? Thank you. Uh, I, I think it's very important to um, emphasize the rational, uh, rationalism of the initial decision. So it's not that we came up with shapes. We simply looked at the different topologies of the existing uh, kind of theaters uh, and, and simply adopted those shapes in, in their pure form. So there was very little uh, imagination or invention about that. The invention kind of resided in purifying those shapes and also combining them in a new way. So what I think has been lost a little bit in kind of architectural discourse in the last 20 years, that rational, rationalism and reason is one of the critical parts of architecture. And, and that therefore, because only if you are operating on a kind of rational level, is there also the kind of possibility to actually communicate. Because uh, something rational can be kind of understood, you can communicate about it, you can criticize it, but it is accessible you know, more than kind of something which is supposedly creative, which comes out of nowhere, and which is simply the creation of the architect. So, uh, yeah, and in, in these uh, really rational shapes that were described through a black box theater, which is a box with a flat floor, a globe theater uh, with uh, a tier and balconies as close as possible, and the Grand Theater as a wedge uh, with the ideal uh, rack to, for, for viewing uh, to the stage and the orchestra pit. It was uh, an important uh, decision to keep these shapes on the outside as pure as possible, but create a double skin in them, which you see in all three, so that the infrastructure and, for example, the special uh, cafes and lobbies would fit within uh, that uh, rationale of the uh, of the theaters, there would not be an addition to it, uh, so that it would kind of be different statements at the same time. We really wanted to combine it and keep it as pure as possible. All right. And uh, there's a question online. So I say it's about the asp aspiration words for architects. Uh, I, I think what was really important for us here was the collaboration. Uh, and not only with on the client side, not only with uh, engineers, and, but especially with architects, not only Chris Yao, but also other architects in Taiwan that we got to know very well through conversations, through engagement, the schools where we uh, came and, and lectured and, and discussed. I think one of the key things about architecture is communication, is bringing ideas together, discussing them, and uh, uh, making sure they have merit. And then, in the end, you can really convince uh, people to go alongside of these ideas. And that is one of the things that we encountered here, actually, in an unbelievable, profound way. Uh, there was discussion from day one. Uh, it was not something we had to introduce. It was quite natural. So we really hope that the architectural uh, um, uh, profession here can really intensify that debate amongst each other with clients, uh, not only public, but also commercial clients, and really try these new solutions that are for Taipei and for Taiwan. You have a unique city uh, that isn't gentrified like many cities. You have a city with rough edges that can allow for new things. And uh, it's part of our profession to introduce new things and to experiment in, in many ways. And we hope that you, not only young architects, but also architects that are already in the profession for long, can really bond together on that perception. From a traditional point of view to a very futuristic point of view, they're all very relevant and they're all very connected. And there is a question on, online. So it's been said that this is a liberating the theater. It's like liberating the hierarchy. This is because the is it because the theater is like a social criticism, or is this related to your past experience as a journalist? Um, does this design uh, apply to all, ki all countries? Uh, 
I, I think there's kind of something uh, really uh, fascinating about uh, this question. Um, I would say that uh, what we try to do here is not necessarily to, um, uh, to, to reinvent the theater. We actually took the theater uh, and the classical theater very seriously. So in addition to any of the new possibilities that the building contains, it has three classical theaters of a very high uh, technical quality with uh, excellent acoustic uh, conditions, where classical theater can be played, classical ballet, classical concert, Chinese opera, where all of it can be played in a kind of way which doesn't put particular pressure on them. But in addition, we were able to combine those things in a completely new way, which offers new possibilities. So it's not necessarily kind of based on a criticism, but it's based on an impatient with, uh, impatience with laziness. Uh, be, because very often, you know, an architecture project is a direct response to the kind of brief. And, you know, when the response is direct, then the, the architect stops. We, we want to be incredibly scrupulous uh, in terms of the brief, but then we want to go further and see how, what more we can offer and extract from these ingredients. So I would say it's more based on creativity than on criticism. And that also really requires an investment of not, not only looking at the words, but understanding the words in the mind of, of the client, uh, which through cultures can be different, uh, as we all know, and at the same time invest to be there and have constantly that uh, discussion. So during this uh, kind of long period of time, uh, Rem and myself were here extremely frequently, not only to discuss with our collaborators, but also kind of to encounter kind of that debate and discussion which is needed to question it, but also to bring it further and to actually try to add things out of curiosity to it that we might be able to signal and that is not part of a bureaucratic process, but that is maybe part of, of the invention that we can deliver. We'll take more questions from the audience. Um, Mr. Xie, please. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to uh, use uh, the uh, super theater. I will be a director for a show for this super theater. Um, I'm very happy uh, to have this opportunity because my uh, the theme of my production is Nexen, N E X E N, and now we have this. Uh, Grand Theater and the Blue Box, which can be combined into a super theater. And it's uh, uh, like a uh, passage, a great passage with uh, 80 meters in length. I already um, tested this, and I, I like this space, and the design um, fits my idea very well. I visited Chris Yao and learned that you are inspired by the amphitheater, uh, the uh, Colosseum um, in uh, ancient Rome. I, uh, my my um, production will be about uh, God, uh, the invisible God coming into our uh, world and um, the people um, in, on Earth wants to go to another realm. So uh, it's visible and invisible. So uh, I utilize uh, your design with this uh, passage and I uh, use the, um, the um, columns of the temple, the um, of Greek temples, and they um, are really um, a perfect fit uh, for my production. Uh, we have uh, performers, uh, dancers, and music, and uh, projection. 
I uh, combined everything I can offer. It's going to be an interdisciplinary uh, realization. So it's like um, you were the, the theater you have designed uh, is uh, it, going to work perfectly with my production. And, and uh, that uh, kind of confirms you know, our boldest uh, dreams that, uh, that we didn't do this uh, simply for nothing, but that there is an appetite for it. But that, that is, of course, what we deeply ho uh, hope, and that's why I introduced the word embrace. This building needs to be kind of embraced, and the, the appetite that we feel can really exist needs to become manifest. And for me, these two gods would be imagination and curiosity. Mm -hmm. uh, so we're very curious to what you will uh, create there, and we hope that we can actually be present uh, to see it. Now, we have another question here online. This uh, project um, has been like uh, has been through maybe like 10 years, more than 10 years. So a lot of ideas might have changed over the passage of 10 years. Now, um, this performing center is completed. So um, have you experienced any changes in your ideas since the very beginning until now as an architect? I, I, I have the kind of strange uh, feeling always when I see a kind of finished building that uh, it allows you kind of not to uh, walk the, through the building as if everything was kind of invented by you or produced by you and the team with great difficulties but I have a kind of walk with a kind of freedom as if I had nothing to do with the building. Uh, and, and therefore, as if I am there for the first time and can basically discover kind of some of its uh, qualities, some of its uh, extravagance, uh, some of its surprises. So I become naive again, uh, and, and that's a kind of great luxury that, that also enables you uh, for the first time to enjoy instead of kind of walking around uh, with, uh, in the grips of a kind of constant anxiety. Yeah, we, we obviously have been here for a long time because the building took longer than anticipated. Uh, but we have always enjoyed every stage of it, uh, the up parts, the uh, parts that are less fortunate. Uh, but they all enriched the discussion and debate and in the end, the end result for us. But as, as we introduced, I think a project like this is also never kind of really finished because the use of the building will add to its possibilities, will add to its imagination. And it also means it will constantly continue. And we will follow that with great uh, anticipation and definitely not with uh, fear. And we hope that we can help you tune uh, the situation to the maximum and, and to deliver the maximum uh, possibilities and opportunities. Also take away some of the anxieties uh, that might be there. Uh, we are happy to go in that discussion and help you uh, with that. There was a question there. Okay, there's a uh, yeah, yeah. One question from the live audience. Uh, I'd like to ask that uh, because I saw a lot of like the escalator and or stairs uh, direct connect to or inject in one space to another space. Actually, I saw a lot uh, this gesture or this element in a lot of your in your projects. So I'd like to know that does it have any special meaning for you to connect the, uh, the two space directly or, or where did you get this inspiration uh, from anywhere? This is, this is my question. Uh, I would say there, there, uh, there's so-called modern architecture which is kind of really uh, an architecture that is uh, trying to invent new forms. And that is kind of introducing and building in the world kind of forms differently and uh, new, new identities. Uh, I'm interested in a different kind of uh, modernity which uses the elements uh, that are invented in the kind of relatively recent period and that basically uh, uses them to change architecture from the way it was. <clears throat> and uh, in, when I wrote a book about New York, I was kind of really studying in the first place the elevator, because the elevator is a kind of really radical device 
which makes and changes architecture fundamentally and forever, because it then enables you to establish a mechanical connection instead of an architectural connection. And so that is also why we are interested to use modern apparatus like the escalator, because it's a very efficient way to get from A to B without necessarily going through all the kind of intermediary uh, conditions and without having to invent an architecture that kind of leads you kind of through, through a building. And I, I also think that a building like this, immediacy is very important to show your intentions with a, a very clear and immediate mind so that you can really orient, okay, I go from there to there, that's where I need to be. And at the same time, there are other possibilities to discover it in a more slow motion or in a most, more slow mo uh, mode of even work or, or participate in something in a more uh, um, direct way instead of coming here to consume a theater play. So that immediacy versus uh, the discovery is an important part that we play in uh, with our, uh, in our, our architecture. Huh? There's a fast lane, but also a slow lane. Yeah. Uh, one question online. Although you have explained this before about the dimensions, uh, it's the same as the other theaters, but uh, in real experience, the audience, especially in the Grand Theater, when they sit down, they feel rather tight and the spacing uh, makes it very inconvenient to access, to go in and out. So in terms of real experience, uh, that, that's uh, our, the response and complaint that we've heard. How do you respond to that? I think every feedback is very valuable, and obviously we need to discuss it together, how to uh, respond to it uh, also with clients and, and others. Uh, but we feel that we uh, kind of answer to the brief in a very accurate way. Uh, you asked for very good sidelines, you asked for 1,500 seats. And yes, maybe now, uh, uh, a bit at a time, uh, there are some other requirements that you also discuss. Also, the comparison uh, with other theaters and also being in the space ourselves, experiencing it, we see no significant difference to many theaters around the world. We also don't experience them. We can sit comfortably. Yes, you sometimes need to get up if somebody gets late uh, to pass, but that is in many theaters in the world, and actually uh, we have some space to also move around uh, if necessary. So we understand and we heard uh, the same uh, comments. Uh, as you know, we are analyzing them with you and uh, we, we will construct a response other than purely a technical response. But we feel uh, that people need to learn how this uh, uh, theater, what it actually provides, uh, and uh, that that means that certain things are prioritized uh, uh, above others. Um, but that is also part of the lecture today, while we are explaining it uh, and, and actually elaborating on it. We hope people start understanding and maybe have a different experience next time they go there. And, uh, and I would also say it's simply necessary to get used to, to new things. Yeah. Uh, it needs time. A question from the live audience. Please pass the microphone. The, the architect uh, is a very long career, and the later works are usually more exquisite and mature, but they also tend to be similar in uh, styles. But OMA uh, is constantly experimenting and challenging itself, so how do you uh, keep uh, putting your fingers on the pulses of our society. We also know that RIM is growing on, growing on in years. Have you thought about retirement and what would you like to do when you retire? Uh, no, I haven't uh, thought about uh, retirement uh, because I'm still interested in doing new things and I'm still driven uh, by curiosity. 
Uh, and I think we, it's very important that we are a partnership, and this partnership has different generations, uh, different nationalities, uh, different sensibilities, and different talents. And I think that therefore, you know, there is a kind of constant uh, interaction, but also constant pressure uh, on each other, and, and uh, a, a constant demand that we are not slipping into a kind of routine, uh, but that we uh, maintain a kind of freshness. But one important kind of part of that freshness is perhaps, we, we were asked this morning uh, by a journalist, is Asia an important market for you? And I think that both we instinctively kind of responded, it's not a market, uh, Asia is a subject. Uh, Asia is a constellation of different kind of cultures, and we are almost like sociologists or anthropologists, uh, really interested in engaging with each of those cultures and, and each real engagement, whether it is with China or with uh, uh, Taiwan, represents a discovery and really represents, uh, in a way, a kind of additional understanding of the world that, that we b benefits our work in general. So, so that is how we look at it, but that also is the secret why we continue uh, to, to work with a certain freshness, because there is always fresh subjects in the world. There are always new things to look at, uh, to not take for granted, to bring into the discussion. Uh, and that's something we constantly do, not only in the partnership, but also uh, with our team, uh, not uh, senior architects to interns, they're all part of that. Uh, with our collaborators, uh, like uh, Chris Yao, for example, uh, with other uh, people from outside the project even, because we really believe that that discussion will table topics that we are maybe not necessarily aware of. And for us to instantly say Asia is not a market, we don't see it as a bag of money that we uh, come and, and, and take and extract. Uh, actually, we invest in Asia in a way, uh, Rem lived in uh, Jakarta when he was uh, small. I was studying in Japan because I wanted another perspective than purely the European. Uh, I lived in Hong Kong for a, a long time to really understand uh, the different context of the greater China, but also uh, the Southeast Asia. So it, for us, these things are not one. There are many traditions, there are many beliefs, there are many futures. And, and, and they are not uh, there to judge, uh, they are there to understand and to uh, try to extract ideas from and help ideas realize. And that for us is, is the driver in architecture, reinventing yourself, adding to yourself, giving extra, uh, gaining extra knowledge, but also giving uh, what your observations are, uh, are an important driver for the research-driven approach we have. Um, and also not giving up, yeah? Yeah. Uh, uh, that is a very important part. Uh, uh, yes, there are doubts, uh, yes, sometimes people say no because they don't know yet why, and then you question the no, and if in the end it turns out to be no, we accept it and we go in a different direction. But really questioning it, looking at it from all perspectives and trying to understand things before judging them is a very, very important part of our practice. And that uh, is what, what we do, and therefore also different generations are constantly present because everybody has a different point of view, right? It's upbringing, it's a uh, uh, level of how they interact with technology, space, understanding, uh, education, access to money, social issues, all are part of that. And we are in an interesting moment with COVID, uh, has an important effect on the world. So yeah, suddenly we're thrown uh, to your own spot a little bit more, interaction is different, uh, but you have to constantly try to find ways of keeping that going and keeping that mode existing so that we can learn from each other and, and, and don't give up, because that's what we need to do. Oh. <laughs> this is it.
One online question. This is more technical about the acoustic engine. Uh, this is from an acoustic engineer. In observing the Grand Theater and the PP, he found that the acoustic absorption is mostly from the chairs, the seating, and the walls are reflective. So there's a lot of reflection and uh, causing a little bit of um, vague uh, sounds. So, and some curves in the P PP cause the, uh, some of the sound wave to reflect to specific points. So what kind of ideas did you use to design the acoustics of these two theaters? Yeah, actually, I think it's very important that this is part of the education process of how to use the theaters. Uh, we have worked with international and local acoustic specialists to develop the system. Yes, it looks as if the seats are the only uh, softscape, but actually there's acoustic plaster uh, on the walls. There are panels that can be tuned. There are reflectors on the top that you obviously need to uh, start deploying and also learn how to work with them. Uh, there are kind of also parts in the stage uh, so that uh, uh, reflections can be diverted and, and different. So that is something uh, we really want to have the conversation on. Also your experience in that is very valuable for us. Uh, and we would hope that soon uh, we can also bring the designers of that acoustical idea here uh, to work with uh, people like you that uh, uh, operate the theater and explain what the possibilities are, explain what the points of view are. And maybe then next time it feels uh, as if you uh, can use it in a, in a better way. And we are also very curious about your feedback. So we again can tune it uh, into a direction uh, that you need uh, to perform uh, well. I think uh, everybody knows that a uh, kind of new theater uh, kind of requires uh, tuning, uh, as it is called, and adaptation. And that that uh, kind of period of tuning can take a year or a year and a half or, or even slightly longer. Uh, and basically built in the theaters there are kind of uh, very subtle uh, elements of potential variation. So I'm definitely not kind of worried that this is a kind of permanent condition. It requires the kind of interaction between the users, the staff, and, and basically uh, uh, our engineers to, uh, to refine it. Uh as they say, Rome is not built in one day. A theater takes at least two years to slowly sculpt it into the shape we want. Our acoustic department is also working hard on the tuning. In the beginning, through uh, all kinds of different programs, they all have different acoustic requirements. So we are making those adjustments uh, from how, uh, where to uh, hang the speakers to the acoustic panels. Uh, this is difficult, and we are t going to take time to do it. One more question from the live audience over there. And another one over there. I've got two questions for the speakers. Uh, the first one is the decision making. You've decided uh, the theater, you've studied the theaters of all kinds, yet you saw uh, several types of them through your presentation. So I wonder how you choose these specific types other, instead of others. And the second one is more about this designer's decision. You introduced the loop that was designed for the public. This means that no matter a person can afford the price of the ticket or not, can watch the play. But in reality, the public should buy the ticket for the loop experience. Uh, what's your opinions on this like, kind of conflict? conflicts? Thank you. Um, I think, let, let me start with the first issue first. Um, it's a mistake to think that an architect is ever in a position to kind of randomly choose what he wants to propose. Uh, basically, uh, before we start the competition, there is a so-called competition brief, which is a very kind of thick book of hundreds of pages where the organizer of the competition is extremely specific about every one of the kind of conditions, the size of the theater, the kind of theater, the typology of theater, all of this is a given before the architect even starts. <clears throat> 
And I cannot emphasize that enough because we are kind of always working with that kind of very precise uh, kind of work and then perhaps recombining it in a different way or interpreting it in a different way. But the given is the given not by the architect, but it's a given that is at the basis of every architecture project. And I personally believe that an architect cannot kind of invent out of nowhere and that there is always the need to start with an initiative that is defined by other people. And that is for me the essence of architecture. It's a kind of response to a demand kind of rather than simply an, an, a form of creation uh, in, in a void. And uh, research, uh, doing research and also looking at other uh, possibilities in different contexts uh, give you extra uh, information that you can deploy to give answers, but you can never copy them because the response is always extremely contextual, not only from a cultural point of view, but also from a site perspective or a regulation perspective. There's never one thing you can copy somewhere where else you always have to kind of look at things uh, for a specific uh, condition. And in terms of uh, free or not free, we are just here uh, and we are discovering kind of certain uh, kind of things. We haven't uh, be even been able to uh, discuss it with uh, the kind of organization. Uh, but uh, yes, it is true that there uh, is an intention to make the thing accessible so that this entity doesn't have to be uh, interpreted as a kind of uh, a building for the elite. About the public loop and the charge. Of course, we have an ideal in the beginning, but in terms of operation, there are difficulties. Uh, we are a uh, non-government organization. We cannot rely 100% on the government. Of course, uh, the, uh, the small token that we charge for the 150 that we charge for the public loop, uh, we cannot really make money for it. But we uh, have added uh, some immersive experience to it. And we should charge for it. Otherwise, yeah, it'll be uh, too popular. We can only allow 20 persons at a, uh, per tour. And uh, so it's just a few hundreds a day. So we need a by charge mechanism to control the number of people. Of course, the charge is not a lot. It's not going to be a significant revenue, but it's a way of marketing for us. And we can offer discounts. For instance, if you buy tickets here, or if you uh, buy food at the Shirley Night Market, then we give you a certain uh, deduction, like discount on the ticket to the public loop. So this could be a, a way for us to marketing different campaigns. And the free lunch is not the best maybe, lunch. Maybe over time right? we can find a sponsor. Uh, there, there are all kinds of uh, models that uh, uh, can take care of uh, this kind of issue uh, in, a, in a new way. I think there's one, yeah, one more audience here who wants to ask a question. Uh, the first one you mentioned the uh, concept of this Taipei Performing Arts Center. Uh, it is the by combining all the three theaters and combining all the backstages and the office space and and all the public space into one curtain glass wall box and uh, through my architectural education we, we learned that um, the private parts the the way people walk in and the public is Sometimes the flow is separated for a reason, and so why, um, just out of curiosity, why do you want to combine the public and private and all the backstage um, workers? Sometimes those, there are things that are, should not be revealed and should not be seen. And the second question is, uh, the Performing Arts Center is nicknamed Century Egg Tofu, which is a 
iconic Taiwan side dish in restaurants, and what did you think about it? Thank you. Basically, I think it's a mistake to think that we are simply mixing everything in a box and then kind of don't take care of either separation or different flows or different identities. On the contrary, basically, you we saw it maybe in David's drawing, there's a kind of very strict planning that kind of orchestrates, you know, which entities need to be able to work on their own, where interaction is necessary or productive uh, and, and where openness or an encounter between public and private is desirable. Yeah, there, there are really three different uh, ribbons, uh, the, you could say, that mix inside of that uh, cube. Uh, they have their independency at moments, they sometimes touch only visually, and there are moments where there's communication possible. But it's definitely in, and not done in such a way that each space can be used by everybody and everybody can go everywhere. We looked very carefully at privacy, we looked very carefully about working conditions versus uh, larger groups, uh, versus uh, leisure, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So, but they are all condensed in this cube to have the least uh, uh, footprint possible and to really invite this urban energy into these different flows uh, uh, of the theater and, and actually bring it to the stage, we hope, uh, bring it to the working environment, bring it to the rehearsal spaces so that the energy is actually everywhere and not just in parts. Uh, and in terms of the nickname, uh, I'm very flattered that our building is compared to the Taiwan national dish. Uh, we've been in kind of less uh, flattering uh, situations with other buildings. All right. And here's one more question online. I try to read it because I don't quite understand. Do you? To, is it your idea to innate, uh, like embed the vitality of the city into the architecture and then you, you emancipate or free up uh, the space of the theater? So, um, do you also uh, re-examine uh, the uh, form of this the space uh, relative uh, to the night market, to the metro station? So, the form. Um, is more than the function. And is it possible that uh, the vitality uh, can can be um, like overflow um, from the city and in, into the, the space? Uh, we thought about connecting it to the city a lot. Uh, actually, you see it in many uh, different moments, uh, not only on the ground plane, which is actually part of the city, uh, but also where we are sitting today. It's, it's connecting to the same level of, of an important infrastructural system uh, that the activities of uh, can communicate. Uh, but we also kind of really looked at kind of how the green is not just confined on, on the bottom, but actually takes parts uh, of the city. And also even in the aesthetics, you see that in parts we take the aesthetics of the city, uh, which is, uh, is sometimes industrial and and rough and sometimes uh, very beautiful and, and sensible into the building. So, yes, these are interpretations uh, that came out of the discussions we had while we were designing this, but we definitely believe that parts of the city of Taipei are uh, here and, and familiarly here, and at the same time we also believe new things uh, are introduced uh, that enrich that already existing uh, situation. So it's a it's a communication uh, that is constant uh, and, and that will also evolve over time because society is changing, the use of the building will be changing and also the people that use it will be changing. So there are many points of view uh, that you need to accommodate in an urban uh, context uh, that go beyond a specific uh, moment. My, my favorite building, uh, picture of the building is uh, kind of from the night market in a street with full of billboards, incredible graphic uh, overkill, where kind of somehow at the end you see the kind of sphere of the building, and you see that although they are totally different, they totally are compatible and coexist in a kind of very productive way. So uh, I think that uh, that is also maybe a kind of issue of scale, that we didn't make it higher or and that, uh, you know, it has a kind of simple form, 
because that is all very simple forms. So uh, that relationship, uh, I would say, is, is established and is kind of really one of the, for me, undeniable uh, successes of the whole thing. This will be the last question for tonight. Uh, may I uh, respond to this? Uh, I think uh, Austin or Jiaru uh, and uh, those who are younger than you um, perhaps uh, do not know that uh, cinema and theater uh, were very uh, prevalent in Taiwan in the old days. Um, people uh, could uh, uh, see uh, the uh, Taiwanese opera or uh, puppy theater for free, and they could see uh, the backstage um, because these performances were on the street. They were performing in front of the temples. And thousands of people and watch uh, these performances together. For instance, when I was a kid, I could bring my own small chair and watch these uh, uh, performances. And cinemas uh, were uh, at one time uh, very uh, popular in Taiwan. And at the end, um, like five or 10 minutes uh, until the end, the cinemas would open their doors for anyone. I mean, anyone who uh, didn't buy tickets, they could uh, uh, get into the cinema, uh, or at least they're at the doorstep, at the doorstep, and uh, watch uh, the movie. Um, so they, those who could not afford tickets uh, could uh, see uh, the end of the movies. And I've also heard the cinemas that uh, project their loudspeakers onto the street uh, for the last 30 minutes of the movies. That could also act as an advertising because that's uh, the, the last uh, the 30 minutes of the movie, perhaps the most exciting uh, part, and perhaps they could attract the audience to buy tickets uh, into the cinemas. So, um, the backstage, that's a uh, part of the performance. And if you go through this public loop uh, without buying a ticket, you could uh, uh, get a glimpse into the performance. So I think, in a way, it also um, responds to this uh, culture of Taiwan, uh, the earlier days of Taiwan, uh, when cinema and uh, street performances were very prevalent. And of course, uh, people in my age would understand, and those who are younger perhaps do not. That's why I want to share this. OK. Any response? No. Uh, thank you. We're really oh, happy with that. Um, yes, uh, thank you very much for this um, uh, sharing. Um, this theater. Well, uh, you can see that this is uh, not some um, high-brow uh, place. Um, this is not just for the cultural elite. The uh, plaza on the ground floor uh, can be uh, open for public use. Um, Many people, um, like uh, the residents, uh, they uh, come and uh, sit at uh, the, door, the staircase. Um, this theater is very different from national theater because the national theater is like a grand structure and everyone who go there um, see, seem to be very serious and they know they need to be elegant or quiet. But here, this is different. Um, you, you know, uh, our furniture is different. The public furniture, you can uh, sit in the uh, in any way. Uh, so that that's also a form of emancipation. Uh, this is an example of uh, freeing up the space and making this theater um, accessible for the public. This is the end of today's talk, and thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. And perhaps we can have a group photo together. Um, our photographer will take a picture of those who are on the stage, to, and then we'll take a group photo along with the audience. Yes, no, you stay.
Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah,